The world is shaken to its very core because God D. Usa pulls his master move by reversing the reverse Uno, breathing fire, and knocking out sugar in the process. I'll rise for our God. Hello my fellow wannabe straw hats and welcome back to the One Piece saga. Where today we'll be jumping head first into what is by miles the biggest arc and with a crime boss premise that has had me buzzing for the past three weeks. So for the sake of my own sanity, don't be too surprised if I jump over some things, because this arc is seriously jam-packed. But alright, enough dilly-dallying, let us get right into... Dress Rosa. We opened the arc with a few more follow-ups about everything going on elsewhere in the world. Notably, we see the Navy talk about all the Doflamingo warlord quabbles, etc. And while all of that is great, we get the confirmation that the letter Buggy received in post-war was indeed an invitation to the Seven Warlords. I think you already know by now that I am not the biggest Buggy fan by a long, long stretch. But for real, if we see Luffy and Law defeat Kaido only for Buggy to somehow get the spotlight for doing that and become an Emperor as well, I will literally flip. But anyway, cutting to the crew, we see them arrive at Barcelona. Oh, I mean Dressrosa. No wait, that joke doesn't quite work. Um... We arrive at Rome... Eh, not quite either. We arrive at Barca Rome... Wait, is this Oda foreshadowing Bartolomeo? Hmm... But oh boy, did I love the setting. Considering Dofi's powers, the whole vibe of a city of toys being controlled by a puppet master was very much on the nose, but it was so, so creative that I couldn't help but enjoy every bit of it. And as if all that wasn't enough, the whole crime boss vibe in the background was even more awesome. Obviously, with Luffy's arrival, it was almost a certainty that his precious kingdom would indeed crumble. So it very much had that Narcos-type vibe as we watch his empire fall bit by bit. Genuinely, if I had to rank the arcs by settings and overall vibe, Dress Rosa is 100% very high up there. It might not quite beat out Drum Island because I am very, very biased there. I mean, I think you remember my reaction, but I'd still say it is a solid S tier when it comes to the location. So yeah, off to an incredible start already. And another thing that turned out to be so, so much more important than I could ever imagine is the crew splitting up here. Not to jumble up the flow of the video too much, we'll talk about the whole Big Mom thing later, but I've gotta say, I seriously enjoy Oda taking some risks here. Sending off a part of the crew and introducing about 300 more characters at the same time is a bold move that, in my opinion, yielded some mixed results. Some very very interesting and definitely great, but some not so much. And in a similar vein, let's address the elephant in the room which no doubt at least somewhat impacted my perception of the events. The pacing. I don't think there's any way around it, it was just downright bad. Even while binging, it was so noticeably stretched out that I even did something that might get me cancelled. I switched to the dub for the Colosseum episodes. Before you grab your pitchforks, let me explain what I mean. The thing with the pace in Dress Rosa is that I felt like everything was just slowed down. There wasn't even really that much filler, everything was just slow. Instead of three establishing shots, we got five. Instead of them being three seconds each, they were five. Instead of us seeing a flashback twice, we saw it five times, and so on. I could get into a much, much bigger debate about seasonal releases and overworking animators etc here, but that's not really in the scope of this series. So I'll just wrap this whole thing up with, yes, it was pretty bad. But, if you intend on watching the series regardless, I think there are more than enough strong moments in this one that it is still very much worth a watch. And for the sake of the tier list, I'll offer up two rankings. One taking the pacing into account, while the other will be purely based on story. And if I see a single re I told you so comments, I will, I don't know, I guess I'll just be mildly annoyed. Anyway, finally returning to the story, it's here where we see the crew all get disguises, which in as few words as possible was absolutely brilliant. I've always been fascinated by how writers manage to pull off this dichotomy of these absolutely ridiculous settings and disguises that somehow never take away from the seriousness of the story. Let's be honest, Luffy looks ridiculous, but like two episodes in, I'm fully on board and yeah, that is Luffy for this arc. 
I think Araki's writing in JoJo is another excellent example of this sort of stark contrast that has always worked very well. As there too, the seriousness is very much juxtaposed by complete chaos and wackiness. But without getting caught up in the weeds too much, the TLDR is that their disguises were simply excellent. And I don't know if I was delirious here or what, but I wrote in my notes, hey hold up, what's with the five elder stars parallel? Don't ask me why, but that was the first thing that popped into my mind when I saw this. Skipping ahead a little, we run into the blind man who we'd later find out to be Admiral Fujitora. And oh boy, from the very first moment I saw him, I knew his power has to be absolutely off the charts. And that would be more than confirmed as we saw his gravity powers in action. Number one, the gravity power itself is just awesome, and I'd love to see the true extent of it. Especially because by the looks of it, it doesn't even have a range since he can just fling in meteors left, right and center. But number two, he marked the start of many, many questions regarding the fruit powers we see in this arc. Because in this one more than any other, I genuinely couldn't help but ask, wait what? Considering that his range appears to be, if not infinite, then absolutely massive, how can anyone realistically face him? If he can pull a meteor from space, he can also use his gravity power on you from literally an island away, right? Either there is something I don't understand about it on a fundamental level, or it is very broken. And before you say stop applying real-world logic to anime, I'm not, because if I was, then it makes even less sense. I'm purely talking about what we've already seen in-universe. But anyway, especially with how this arc would end, the number of theories regarding Fujitora I already have is simply ridiculous. Everything from him also being someone with the Will of D, to him having some sort of prophecy-type powers a la Madame Charlie, and everything in between. We'll be talking plenty more about him later in the arc, but right off the bat, he seems like such a deep and morally complex character that I cannot wait to find out more about him, and on which side exactly does he even stand. Though it's here that we get our first absolute bombshell of this arc. Doflamingo has Ace's fruit. We'd also get a confirmation of how the whole fruit reborn process works, showing that it is indeed as simple as the fruit reappearing somewhere in the world upon its wielder's death. And that is cool and all, but one question, how well known is this fact? This might have just been a faulty assumption on my part, but I thought that this sort of thing would only be known by the likes of Vegapunk and Caesar, but no, it comes from some rando on the streets. So yeah, I can't tell whether this is just some convenient storytelling, or the whole fruit reborning process is actually well known in the new world. But looking past that, I'll be the first to admit that my jaw absolutely dropped at this point. Of all people who could have gotten their hands on it, of course it had to be Dofi, right? Though that now makes me wonder, if the fruit process really is this simple, why isn't everyone walking around with a basket of fruit just in case someone dies in their proximity? That seems way too easy, but Smiley's fruit spawned literally next to its death, so I guess it works? So yeah, I am a little confused about the whole fruit reborning process even now. But aside from all that, what I enjoyed here was the Luffy Frankie dynamic as, correct me if I'm wrong, we haven't really seen them team up like this before. I think there was that one time in Thriller Bark, but this is just the two of them and I really like the duo. And I won't lie, Frankie trying to keep Luffy in check and stopping him from breaking disguise had me laughing out loud most of the way through. And this is a duo I'd really love to see again sometime in the future. And in a broader sense, I think someone of the crew should tag along with Luffy more often, since a lot of the time, he's forced to run off on his own to fight the big bads. That would also happen to some extent here after Law was taken out of the running, but I seriously enjoyed it while it lasted. Anyway, enough rambling about that. It's here that the absolute wackiest part of this arc begins, as Luffy dons the name of Gladiator Lucy and enters the Colosseum, simultaneously playing right into Dofi's plan. For the sake of time, I obviously won't cover everything that goes on here, but when it comes to crazy fantasy pirate shenanigans, this was top draw. But, with that said, I still think this was also by miles the weakest part of the arc. 
both because the pacing here was just dreadful, as well as the fact that I think there was a bit of fatigue caused from just dumping so, so many new characters on you, most of whom you're not even sure will lead to anything. In retrospect, I do think that it was quite a big brain move considering how important their ridiculous combined power would be later, but on initial viewing, I somewhat began to tune out. This might sound weird to some of you, but the battles in One Piece are not even in my top 5 things about One Piece, so just having like 20 of them back to back honestly got a little old, even with many of them being incredibly creative. So yeah, much better in retrospect, but on initial viewing, a mixed bag for sure. Though returning to what I mentioned before with Dofi, I couldn't help but notice the symbolism in Luffy's actions in this arc. First, he arrives on the home turf of Dofi, which is already bold. He then just so happens to dress up like Dressrosa's most legendary gladiator, and fights his way through basically the entire Colosseum. And as if all of that wasn't enough, he defeats Dofi on, again, his home turf and liberates Dressrosa. With how much we've been talking about prophecies lately, especially with the likes of Charlie, I know this sounds absolutely crazy, but I can't help but think about the concept of fate in the story of One Piece. Even going as far back as Logtown, Zoro throwing the sword and not getting his hand chopped off. There are all of these things which, in any other story, I'd write down to anime shenanigans, general storytelling tropes, etc. But with Oda's writing, I don't want to rule out the possibility that even something as fundamental as fate is a tangible thing in One Piece. I mean, look at Fujitora in this arc. There's got to be more to it. And then when you bring in those through lines of Luffy's resemblance to Roger and finding himself in literally identical situations, or Luffy fulfilling what was written by Joy Boy back in Fishman Island, etc, etc, I guess what I'm trying to say here is that Luffy's story is all about breaking the boundaries of fate itself, all while somehow managing to unite everyone, including his enemies, behind him. Like we've already seen in Impel Down, in Marineford, and like we'd also see at the end of this arc. And with all that in mind, entertain this idea for me. What if Luffy's goal of becoming the King of the Pirates never involves the One Piece at all? What if it forever remains as a goal for people to set out for the sea? What if before Luffy reaches the final island, there is something more important? What if what turns Luffy into the King of the Pirates and the most free is him dismantling the world government entirely and destroying the Red Line, thereby bringing unity to the Four Seas and creating the All Blue? With his final words being those of Roger and Whitebeard, but with a subtle change. You are free now, the One Piece is real, and now you just have to find it. Considering how mature the One Piece story has already become, and with Luffy, in story, having allies in the tens of thousands by this point, I genuinely feel like that's where we're headed. Plus, that never solves the one fundamental mystery of the story. What is the One Piece? Be honest with yourself. Yes, we'd all be angry if we never found out what it really is. But at the same time, there is not a single thing in this world that can ever live up to the headcanon people have already come up with. So personally, and I know this may be a little controversial, I think Oda should embrace the message of One Piece itself. It was about the journey, and oh boy, was it a journey. Alright, enough philosophy, let us get to what is legit the best new character since Ghost Girl, Bartolomeo. I'll say it right now, he is up there with my favorite characters already. Just how genuine his fan love for the crew is had me laughing out loud the entire time. And the fact that he is introduced as the most vile villain imaginable just makes that so much better. And as I said before, I had switched to the dub for these few episodes in the Coliseum, and I can say it right now, his voice actor in both versions is absolutely impeccable. TLDR? I love Bartolomeo, and if he doesn't become a recurring character suddenly showing up at the end of every arc with supplies for the gang after their fights, I'll be forever disappointed. Make it happen, Oda. But, uh, can he just make a barrier around your neck and suffocate you instantly? Another couple of super important characters we meet is Rebecca and the Toy Soldier. And I suppose it isn't surprising by this point, but man, does Oda know how to write character backstories to get me invested. 
I think bittersweet is the only word that describes their story. Because basically everything surrounding them was absolutely tragic, but their bond was just beautiful. And on this note, can we just talk about how messed up Sugar's ability really is? Obviously the whole turning people into toys and taking away their free will is pretty bad. But just imagine living while knowing that everyone you loved suddenly doesn't even know you exist. For me, that's the part that hits the hardest. From Rebecca's perspective, all she knows is that her mother died, but her father was seemingly never even there. She never got any sort of closure and even though Kiros was obviously by her side the entire time, it's not like she ever knew of what really happened, so that wound was permanently open. But from the toy soldier's perspective, just try to imagine that one day, everyone forgets that you ever even existed. And no matter how much you try to convince them of what has happened, you seem like the odd one out. I don't know about you, but I would probably go mad, as the first question I'd ask is, wait, if no one else remembers me, then surely I am the problem, right? So yeah, Sugar's ability is both disgustingly overpowered when you think about it, as well as just straight up messed up. We also get to see the return of Bellamy, who has changed quite a bit since we last saw him. And I think his narrative arc in this one was also really bittersweet. The whole tragedy of him not being able to break Dofi's shackles was just brutal. But at the same time, seeing his journey from losing his crew in Skypea to finally taking Luffy's message of freedom on board was beautiful. And I think what describes that beautifully is his reaction to Luffy cheering him on. I honestly don't even know how to describe the emotions mixed in there. It's confusion, sort of disbelief, but it's also anger and grief. For what is essentially a side character in the entire Dofi saga, Bellamy is certainly someone I'd love to see more of, especially now that he has seemingly set his sights on his own path moving forward. Another notable character we meet here is Viola, who had been doing a complete 360 throughout the arc. At first, it was blatantly clear to me that she worked under Dofi, so her tricking Sanji didn't really surprise me at all. But then she started doing some fishy business and since no revolutionaries had popped up just yet, I began to wonder whether this is where the obligatory revolutionary undercover saving the Straw Hats moment would happen. Though all of that would of course be proven wrong, as she turned out to actually be Rebecca's aunt. Aside from their final confrontation with Dofi, the most interesting thing for me from her was her fruit power, as I think it showcased just how powerful non-offensive fruits can be. We've seen a few of these support type fruits before, but I'd love for more of these wacky abilities to show up sometime. The only major problem I had with her is how quickly she returned to being a background character after the initial Sanji storyline. Though again, there were already like 300 characters running around, so maybe having another major player in there might have just inflated the arc even more. Though moving on to our first big confrontation between Law, Dofi, and Fujitora. I do admit, my monkey brain flared up and I enjoyed it a lot, I mean, how could I not? This was just three dudes with extremely OP powers tearing the entire place up, right? However, like I said with Fujitora, here too I found myself asking many a question when it comes to their fruit powers. Number one, why didn't Law just swap Dofi with a random rock he threw in the water? Considering just how important the whole curse of the fruit is, Law never even considering such a possibility while they're literally fighting on a bridge seriously made me scratch my head. And number two, why didn't Law swap Dofi's heart with some rando marine? As we saw with Smoker and Tashigi, he loses fruit power and that would obviously make him far less dangerous. Obviously I realize this is an anime battle where we need drama, but considering that we're later shown how he deliberately plans these sorts of switcheroos with Luffy, and the fact that we've clearly seen Shambles works on Dofi, even with his whole awakened fruits, I can't help but notice how bizarre the lack of any strategy seemed here. But anyway, fruit quabbles aside, I think Law blatantly telling Dofi that he believes in the will of D and how it will blow up a storm again was such an incredible moment, which yes, once again made my theory making cogs spin. Though before we get to that, I want to talk about the outcome of this fight. We see the whole Dofi flinging him around and all that, but what is the most important part for me here is him shooting Law. 
because that shows us just how twisted Dofi is. Because of his pseudo deal with Gravity Boy, he can't kill Law. But instead of just leaving him there, he still chooses to taunt him with lead bullets. And keep in mind that he was shooting him here while specifically targeting parts of his body that would ensure survival. If that isn't downright sadistic evil, then I don't know what is. But I do admit, at first, I really got a chuckle how it was made out to be a big deal that they were lead bullets, because as far as I know, most bullets are lead. But when we'd hear of Lost Story, obviously that changed quite a bit. But yes, all the fruit bizarreness aside, I think this was an incredible first confrontation that certainly got me intrigued on just how much of the bigger picture does Law know already. Another thing that I've yet to bring up are the Tentatas. To put it very briefly, once again I think Oda did an extremely good job of introducing a completely new civilization with a pretty complex backstory that would only be explained by the end of the arc. I really enjoyed how initially we're led to believe that there's some mischievous and even sort of evil force, only to then find out that they're actually super friendly. And at the very end, we'd of course get the full explanation that the whole stealing things from Dressrosa is actually a deal they made with the king a long time ago. It was just a really cool way of slowly giving us their full backstory and why they are so so dedicated. But from our crew's perspective, could this be seen as a parallel for Usopp? Remember how he was astonished by the giants of Elbaf? Well, here we have a bit of a role reversal because he is the giant that is praised by all the Tentata. And hey, his stories of commanding armies of thousands actually turns out to be true, so there's also that. In the midst of all that though, the Sunny Squad is having many troubles themselves. Most notably, Big Mom, an emperor, appearing. And like I said at the top of the arc, this is a part of the story that I found very brave on Oda's part. Not only does the crew split up here, but a part of them just leave outright and we'd only see a glimpse of what they're up to at the very very tail end of the arc. This is of course not the first time, I mean we followed Luffy for an entire saga while he was solo, but in this case it's pretty clear that Nami and Sanji's crew are setting up something much much bigger. And what caught me by an even bigger surprise is that Sanji actually does something cool here. Him flying in to stop Dofi from attacking the Sunny, and then casually saying he'll be taking on Big Mom's crew was a very welcome change. Considering what we'd see at the end of the arc, obviously there's more in store for Sanji specifically, but more on that when we get there. I also briefly want to talk about the backstory of Dressrosa itself and the arrival of Dofi. I know I sound like a broken record at this point, but once again, I just want to acknowledge the incredibly dark and serious themes this arc covers. The entire premise of a fake utopia being rotten to its very core is as old as time, but I found its execution here extremely interesting, in large part due to Oda leveraging the world of One Piece and the power of the Devil Fruits. By having Sugar's ability, you can make that stark contrast between those suffering from the oppressive Iron Fist of Dofi and those living in ignorance be so so much more pronounced. Because in-universe, the toys are still those same people with those same beliefs. They just can't act on them because this puppet master, which very on the nose by the way, has taken that away. While the rest of society literally has no recollection of the horrors that took place once Dofi arrived. It's that old passage of the victors writing history that was demonstrated beautifully here in my opinion. And yes, the very concept of Dofi creating a massacre with his power is as dark as it gets. A minor detail that I absolutely loved is Frankie speaking up and saying that he can't follow Law's plan and that he wants to fight on behalf of the Tontada. I just found him speaking up for what he believes to be right to be the perfect contrast to Dofi's crew where stepping out of line literally means death. And that classic Luffy theme kicking in as he says it was just so, so good. I feel like in this arc more than any other, we have seen just how independent the crew is now, with almost half of them sailing away to a completely different island while everyone else splits up. And Frankie now speaking up to his captain and standing up for what he believes to be right, and Luffy to fully take that on board and support him was just incredible. And then we get to this. He left the three cups. 
To give you a bit of an insight into what I was thinking at the time, at this point in the arc, we literally had everyone present. We had warlords, we had marines, we had an admiral, we had other pirates, we had Blackbeard pirates, and we even had an emperor. So who's the only one missing? A revolutionary, right? So, I was already expecting either Dragon himself or someone from their squad to show up. And then we saw that frame of a hat with goggles, which basically confirmed my thoughts on Sabo's return. And yes, I am very glad my theory turned out to be wrong, because him getting Ace's pal right in front of us instead of just popping up was so, so much better. But even with that, their reunion just still hit different. I can't even imagine what it was like for people who were up to date and had to wait for what I assume were months if not years to finally see Sabo again. But even though it hadn't even been that long for me since I met him in post-war, this scene was incredible. I'll be honest with you, originally I liked Ace a lot more than Sabo. But with what we saw here, I can pretty confidently say that has changed. Don't get me wrong, Ace is still an absolute legend. But for me, Sabo's story just seems more complex and even more interesting considering everything that has happened to him since. And I swear, if Oda decided to reintroduce him as the second in command for the revolutionaries, only for him to disappear again, I'll be real mad. And like I also said in post-war, now I wonder why was he reintroduced here specifically? Surely there must be a reason for it, right? So, is it finally time for the revolutionaries to come into the picture? Considering the rest of the crew ran into Big Mom's pirates, who knows, maybe we're going to have an ace situation on our hands where the revolutionaries swoop in to save one of the straw hats? Who knows? But how can I not mention how that is actually revealed to us? Because the whole cutting to them in the most ridiculous outfits ever, as Luffy is just bawling his eyes out saying that he never knew Sabo was still out there, was the dictionary definition of a juxtaposition. I think it's easy for us as the viewer to overlook the fact that for Luffy, Sabo died like, what, 12 years ago? So just imagine a man appearing right in front of you, claiming to be that person who to you, is long long gone. Like I already mentioned with Sugar and the whole memory loss thing, I feel like these sorts of deeply personal and emotional story beats can be lost in all the hype. But yeah, I thought it was absolutely beautiful. And Oda. Don't you even think about pulling another ace. With Sabo being a revolutionary, I seriously don't want another case of us infiltrating Marie Joie to save him, only for him to die in Luffy's arms. We got traumatized once, we do not need that again. However, it would make for a pretty interesting cyclical story if this time, Luffy did succeed, huh? Though on the same note, his fight against Jesus in the Colosseum was so so hype. And it's clear that his power, fruit or no fruit, is absolutely insane. I am very curious about his dragon techniques, as it implies that his fighting style is indeed derived from dragons. But the thing is, there's obviously still the dude, Dragon, who is also a revolutionary. So now I'm left asking, what's up with this whole dragon motif? We already have the celestial dragons, we have Dragon himself, and now a fighting style supposedly derived from dragons. So, is there some sort of through line here? Though then again, Zoro also has a bunch of dragon techniques and those clearly have nothing to do with dragon the person, so who knows. And how can I not mention the animation? The increase in graphical fidelity we've seen throughout these arcs is just absolutely incredible. And of course, that is on full display in this very very hype duel. And similarly, I know some usually call this an inconsistency, but I actually really like all the different art styles we see pop up here. Some of these close-ups are so so different from what we usually see, and some of them legit look like they came from Wit Studio, and I love that. And all of that with the music and the massive hype, I mean, I just loved every second of it. In the meantime, we see the Tantadas put together Operation SOP, Sugar Over Surprised Panic. I do admit, the whole, but wait, what does SOP mean gag had me laughing quite a bit, but again, I just want to emphasize how many things are going on all at once. Genuinely, with each and every arc, I feel like the scope of the story is just getting bigger and bigger, so I don't even want to think about what my coverage of the final arcs will look like. 
But anyway, essentially we learn that if Sugar is knocked out, her control over the toys should disappear and everyone will get their memories back. And while that is great and all, I more so want to ask, what constitutes unconsciousness then? Clearly sleep doesn't count. But that then makes me wonder how lucky they are that this has been going on for years, and not once has she ever been unconscious. I know I'm nitpicking here a little, but again, with how many powers we saw in this one, I couldn't help but notice some of these plot conveniences that are never nearly as visible. Maybe I've missed something, but to me, this seemed like a bit of a, dude, trust me type of power. At the same time, Zoro and Luffy are trying to make their way to Dofi himself, which is where they run into Pebble Boy Pika. I'll say it right now, this was legit one of the coolest powers I think we've seen in the series. I'll hold off all of my Attack on Titan jokes because I don't want to spoil anyone, but I absolutely loved it. Just the sheer scale and destructive power of it alone was a ton of fun, and I'd honestly love to see more of this sort of massive enemy vibe. There's a meme in MMOs that many bosses are so big you're just essentially fighting a skybox, but judging by what we saw here, I think One Piece can pull something like that off. And of course then there's his laugh and voice, which, just like it did for Luffy, almost killed me. And side note, does this even happen in the manga? Because if it does, I am still glad that I saw the anime first, because even if you told me he has a weird voice, I don't think I could picture anything on the scale of this. Telling me he has a funny voice may be a little funny, but actually hearing it, I mean, yeah, I had Luffy's reaction. And speaking of giving me the giggles, the whole key name on disguising himself as Dofi also gave me a great A laugh. Just the sheer absurdity of it, and then him actually being targeted by everyone was a ton of fun. But with that, it is time to get serious, because it's here where we witness something incredible. As Operation SOP nears its climax, Sugar herself finally makes an appearance and saying her power is strong is an understatement, because she begins picking off the strongest members of the Rebellion one by one, even getting Robin in the process. But when all hope seems lost and Sugar pulls the reverse Uno by feeding Usopp the grape, a miracle happens. The world is shaken to its very core because God D Usopp pulls his master move by reversing the reverse Uno, breathing fire and knocking out sugar in the process. All rise for our God. All right, I'm messing around, but if you had seen the smirk on my face at that moment, finally, all of your God Usopp comments made sense. And I can't imagine how smug all of you felt each and every time I dunked on Usopp earlier in the story. Needless to say, I absolutely love this moment, and I guess Oda is going all in on making Usopp that character who lies a bunch about completely unbelievable things, only for them to turn out to be true. And I refuse to believe that this God Usopp thing won't come into play again. I mean, come on. There are thousands of pirates who were ready to devote their lives to him, and there is now literally a statue to commemorate him. But yes, with that, I will now go and build my God D Usopp shrine. But then we begin to enter the endgame as the Dofi fighting gang has made it to his room and Kiro straight up cuts Dofi's head off only for it to be revealed that that was merely a fighting puppet for Dofi. And while this reveal was cool, and I enjoyed that concept of Dofi being the puppet master being used even for his fighting techniques, I did still get to wondering about how the fruits even work then. Dofi's a Paramethia, same as Luffy and Robin, right? But the thing I can't wrap my head around are his fruits limitations and even abilities because they seem very very jank. First off, him basically invalidating Robin's fruit power since he can essentially do the same exact things already does seem a tad bit broken. But okay, it's not like we haven't seen powers that strongly resemble others before. The one that confuses me the most is the birdcage. This is literally a box that a city full of infamous kings and pirates, an admiral, two samurai who are feared for their power, countless marines, the Tantata army, Frankie, Zoro, the revolutionaries, and a whole bunch of civilians can't stop for literally no reason. And better yet, Bartolomeo's barrier, which was literally unmoved by the king punch, is also 100% useless against the cage. Honestly, this just seemed like a pretty lazy plot device to just create an artificial timer for Luffy's battle. 
And we've had better versions of it before, too. The buster call in Ennis lobby, for example, felt much more natural, whereas the cage seems to ignore any sense whatsoever by the looks of it. And sure, you could say that Fujitoro was maybe holding back since he was betting on Luffy and all that, but in my mind, that's just rationalizing what is a fairly poor and forced plot device. And I also wonder why C Prism Stone effects don't transfer onto Dofi since he is manipulating the cage at all times. Technically, it's the same as Luffy's extended arm, isn't it? Yes, he is creating the string, so it's technically just string, but with his puppets, he just gave up control as soon as it was hit. But with the cage, that clearly isn't the case, he does seem to be empowering it somehow. Which in my mind, does imply a connection that should also transfer its effects. But okay, I'm like 50-50 on that one, since he is technically creating string, so the C prism doesn't actually affect his body, but its ability, and so that shouldn't really transfer onto his body, but again, he is clearly empowering it, so there is a connection, and it just makes no sense. We do of course hear that his power comes from an awakened fruit, which does explain how his strings literally became demonic spikes of death. So maybe that explains this entire situation and I'm just making a fool of myself, but hey, those are my first impressions and to me, it seemed extremely janky. And I guess on that note, I'll leave those questions in the air and quickly summarize my thoughts so far. It feels like with this arc more than usual, I mentioned a lot of negatives rather than focusing on all the good parts, but the thing is, that mostly comes from there being just so so much good. Honestly, apart from the whole pacing debacle and the somewhat janky devil fruit usage, so far, Dress Rosa has been incredible. So from a production standpoint, it just makes more sense for me to raise the not-so-great points or the parts that had me asking questions. Because otherwise, I'd be talking about the Sabo reveal for 30 minutes and delving into Dofi's psychology for 40 more. Seriously, the Sabo reveal alone already had me buzzing, and then there's God the Usopp, it's, it's all just been fun. And since you've made it here, I hope you indulge me in a minute of just sheer joy, because I seriously cannot put into words how much I love this universe at this point. With each and every new location we see, I just can't stop being amazed by how many different themes Oda manages to cover, while still telling deeply personal character stories and fleshing out literally decades of history for both the characters in question and even entire nations. But alright, I don't want to spoil the ranking just yet, so next time we'll be delving into the very tragic story of Korra and getting into the final act of Dressrosa. And that's the video. While I've still got you, I have a few extra things to say. First off, there's a bonus video coming this Friday, so keep an eye out for that. And yes, it is One Piece. Secondly, for Patreon supporters, my reaction to Dofi vs Luffy is already up, so feel free to give it a watch. And lastly, there will be a live reading stream on Twitch this coming Sunday covering chapter 1054. And yes, for those of you who have missed it, I am indeed caught up with the manga. All the remaining videos were recorded in the usual formats, which is what I've been doing for the past month, and please send help, I've been working 16 hours a day. So yeah, nothing changes there and past Kuroto will ramble on a whole bunch. And no, I won't be editing out any of my nonsense. There are many, many theories in there that are so completely wrong, it's ridiculous. But anyway, I want to say a massive thank you to our patrons who allow me to produce even more of these for you all. Without you, there'd be a whole lot less of my ramblings, so seriously, thank you, thank you. Other than that, I want to say thank you very much for watching, I hope you have a great day, and hopefully, I'll see you in the next one. Bye bye